people have to want it. That's the only thing I could see stopping anybody nowadays from doing it. Everybody talks about wanting to be able to do it, but they're not doing it, you know? They're not just go get the tool and learn to use it. My name is Patrick Maloney. Most all my friends call me Mo. You know, I liked motorcycles and hot rods long before I could drive. I remember looking out the window of the family car when I was a kid, and my mom would see me eyeballing that guy on a Harley and just knowing it was just burning her up. There was a lot of industrial ed in my high school. I mean, I literally could stick and TIG weld before I got out of high school. When I was first getting into biking in the Navy, um, I kind of inherited some torch stuff and then I, I, I traded some stuff for a set of oxygen and acetylene tanks and I had a good heavy duty half inch drill motor and, and I was literally considered the local machinist among my circle of friends that had motorcycles. And, and I owned a paint gun and a multimeter. I never had a street bike until I joined the Navy. Um, I had some dirt bikes and mini bikes when I was a kid. Uh, joined the Navy and I really was not doing that well the first couple of years. I sort of had a life-changing experience and uh, pulled it together. My new obsession was motorcycles. The Navy was cool. We always had a group of guys. All the guys on the ship that rode Harleys always hung out together. I took care of everybody on the ship that needed any motorcycle stuff done. Nowadays, in some ways, this shop's equipped better than some of those shops, but back then, you know, it was a big deal to help a guy make a sissy bar or weld a hard tail onto his, uh, his Triumph. When I was about 21, I got my first street bike. Um, I bought it from a friend in Chicago and took it back with me to Charleston, South Carolina. And it was a 69 Triumph Bonneville with a big long jammer springer and uh, that's how I got into biking. Six months later, I bought another one. Probably another six months later, I bought a knucklehead rolling chassis with a pair of chrome invader wheels on it and a jocklid four-speed transmission, candy red over gold. I still got the shift knob for it out in that shed. I kept looking for motors and uh, I could not believe it, but I finally, right in the middle of a trailer park, I found a knucklehead motor with a a folder full of receipts, people transferring it from one guy to another over the course of time. Bought that motor for $350 in 1982. Built that motor in, in, in a shed, uh, didn't have electrical power out there, had a Coleman lantern, and if I needed power, I would borrow a 100-foot extension cord from work and run it out there. <laughs> I was taking parts with me from that shop and taking it to the ship I was on and doing work on it. You know, if I needed to bead blast something, I had access to it on the ship. If I had, you know, needed a drill press, I could, I could get it done there. 1986, I got out of the Navy. I was in Norfolk, Virginia. I moved to uh, Gloucester County about probably 90 minutes away. Believe it or not, I went to work in a blacksmith shop. It was my first experience with trip hammers and, and forging and forming steel. And uh, we had coal delivered by the dump truck and literally used regular coal-fired forges in the 1980s. It was filthy, but I mean, it was another huge learning experience. You know, that was a year where I really learned a lot, but at the same time, if I had an idea and threw it out there, he'd try it. Some of our trip hammers were over 100 years old at the time. You know, they all had um, flat belt pulleys and they had been converted to uh, electric motors. Um, they all would have run off of drive shafts in the ceiling of shops. Except for one, it was so big we had to keep it out back and it had a two-cylinder diesel engine running it. One slam sounded like a gunshot. But I was living here in Jacksonville 
and I didn't have a phone, but people always found me. And uh, um, my garage, even then, was probably the best equipped. I had a smaller lathe and a drill press and uh, a small stick welder. And, and, but my friend's garage was a lot more active, and it always had four or five guys every night till 10 o'clock, lights on, working on something. And we didn't even care. We'd take something in that we didn't even know the guy and help him build a running motorcycle out of it. We really didn't care. We were out in the garage having a good time. Where does a kid learn it nowadays if he doesn't go to work in a place that has the equipment? I got jobs because of the, the training I had before, but these kids have to find a job that'll train them or the military. The military's a big deal. Believe it or not, I got out of the Navy and, and I had about three years, four years dabbling in other stuff, including new ship construction. And then I went into aviation for the Navy, and I started fixing aircraft. I got a lot of training in, in, in you know, my different careers. You know, the Navy was a, was a huge, big deal. I did carpentry, new construction, house building, remodeling. Um, and it seemed like, it seems like everything you do, you can, you can get a takeaway from it. A thing I call tape measure common sense. If a guy right out of the chute can't handle a tape measure, it's probably best that he goes into something else. Me and my son went to the turkey rod run. He was about eight years old. We saw another hot rod with an early Hemi like that one and a blower, and I fell in love with that motor. And within 90 days, I found a core early Hemi and bought the engine. It took a, a few years to get it, you know, get it rebuilt, and then I still didn't have a car to put it in. A friend of mine as a gift, he had a bunch of steel left over from a job and he gave me 48 foot of the 2x3 tubing that I made the frame out of. Traded a knuckle motor for that metal Ford Model A body uh, to one of my best friends up in Indiana. Every bit of it was hand built and it was built in that other garage over there. We were just walking around and we saw this car and it was just incredible. It had eight eight carburetors, uh, Magneto, 671 blower, early Hemi, Zoomy pipes, slicks on the street, and it was loud, it was nasty, it was flat black, and I fell in love with that motor, and I said, I gotta find one of those. This pile of parts, I mean, like, I've had those triple trees for 25 years, probably. Judging by the tire, I've probably had that back wheel for 30 years. The motor I bought about five years ago out on the west side of Jacksonville, right here. Um, it had a lot of problems, had to take it apart. I remember where I get stuff. I know it's weird, like that transmission case. I know who owns the motorcycle it came out of. The guy put electric start on that particular pan head, and I wound up getting the case for free. That case has a hole punched in the back of it, you can see right now. He had a plate screwed on there with half a dozen sheet metal screws and ran it that way for 25 years before I got it. I'm gonna weld a little plate over that hole and I'm gonna stuff a transmission in that case. I got it, they're a little hard to get, and I know it's got history. And I don't even care if it has weld repairs on it. That's kind of the way I am with a lot of parts. And I could show you in my shed a million parts to tell you exactly where they came from. I've had a pretty good colorful past in the uh, motorcycle scene. You know, I've met like, I've, I met the guy that invented Supermax belt drives and been in his shop. He's a terrific guy and he's a hands-on guy and he loves sharing knowledge and information. I've met uh, Brother Speed Finley out of Charleston, South Carolina and I remember parking next to Speed Finley and him and I were, were already friends and him and I having a hand kickstart contest. Him with a mag, mag, that magneto shovel pan and I knew that motorcycle when it's still looked like maybe a little toned down show bike but at one time it was a show bike and 
I remember it when it still had the graveyard scene on the tank in 19, probably 81, 82. You know, I remember him telling the tales about um, riding that bike up the Alcan Highway into, into Can uh, uh, through Canada and into Alaska. His uh, derby cover is a cast aluminum uh, bust of a young lady, like from here up, and uh, I remember when it wasn't ground down so far on the bottom. It's literally, it's been on there that long. And he, I think he used to refer to it as old lady number four or something like wife number four. He's a good fella. He's got stories and he's the real deal. Used to be cycle accessories on Phillips Highway. My first shop I went to when I moved to Jacksonville and I go there one Saturday morning and Speed had just woke up. He was sleeping in front of Cycle Accessories with that motorcycle. He had to pull over. They told him he couldn't ride it any further. It was nighttime and his generator had quit working. And he was trying to make it to Charleston on the mag needle alone. But that bike always ran. It's a neat old motor too. It's got flathead flywheels, you know, it's one of the old flathead strokers. I remember all the hand engraving on it. When it was first built, it had a two-throat Weber with a bunch of hand engraving on it. Kind of rough, but neat. I wish I'd have known a little more when I was a kid because when I build, built my first knuckle, all you could buy is these bronze Gary Bang valve guides. And, you know, if I'd have known then that I could buy some uh, valve guide material from uh, Ampco or somebody like that, you know, that makes valve guides, I would have been making my own knuckle guides back then because the bronze guides, they'd melt and stick the valves open. I remember when uh, I wanted to put a coat of Corvette yellow on the knucklehead. I did all the sanding by hand and uh, again this was another space that didn't have any light. I remember sleeping on cardboard in the shop, getting up and painting all day for I think I slept there two nights. Got a perfectly painted set of tanks, fender, and frame out of the deal. The copper tanks on the flathead I hung from the engine cherry picker, and there's a $100 copper colored stain on the driveway where the cup fell off the spray gun. And if you know how much good, good metallics cost nowadays, you know, it's. Uh... This shop is this size because this is the biggest the city of Jacksonville would let me have. 1,200 square foot house, 600 square foot garage. The machinery on wheels helps a lot. I am blessed to be able to store and fix bikes and store two cars, work on them. My name's Patrick Maloney. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm a Dennis Kirk garage builder.